Hi everyone. Well, it's so wonderful to be with you all. If we haven't met before, my name's Simon Benham, and I have the privilege of being the senior pastor across all of our different Kerith sites. And whether you're at one of our in-person events or whether you're watching this online, it's wonderful to have you with us. And today we're starting a new series, a series called Ecclesia. And it seems a very appropriate series. We're asking the question, what is church? And why is it relevant and important to our lives? And it feels particularly relevant as we're beginning to transition from church being primarily online, where we've been watching on our screens, on our TVs, on our laptops, on our iPads, to return to physical church. And hopefully many of us coming back to church physically on Sundays and gathering as church on Sundays. And we really want to take a look again at, at what is church? What is this thing that we call church? And why is it important for our lives? And we're going to root this in one particular book in the Bible. It's a letter called 1 Peter. And it was written by a guy called Peter, one of the early followers of Jesus. You may remember Peter. He was the one who walked on water. He was the one who denied Jesus three times um, he was, as he was being tried. He was the one who on the day of Pentecost preached this amazing sermon and 3,000 people came to faith. And he wrote two letters in the Bible, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, uh, which were written just to groups of Christians, Christians who were primarily being persecuted for their faith. And he wrote to talk to them about how um, their faith could help them through persecution, but actually their faith was also one of the reasons that they were being persecuted because they looked different to the world around them. And I'd really encourage you to get stuck into 1 Peter over these five weeks. I want to recommend a commentary, uh, which I've been using. It's written by a woman called Karen Jobes, um, all on 1 Peter, and it's just outstanding. So you can get that from various book resellers um, all over the place. So we're going to root ourselves in one particular verse in 1 Peter, and we're going to look from this verse. We're going to, from this verse, we're going to bounce off to different parts of the letter. And the verse is this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, says this, But you, speaking to all of us, speaking to me, speaking to you, speaking to the people he was writing to, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him that called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And out of this verse, we want to pick out five different purposes of the church, five different things that church is about, five different things that if you put them together, make up the entirety of what church is. First of all, Peter writes, you are chosen people. We we'll look at how church is community. Church is us as people coming together. Secondly, he says you are royal priesthood. In the Old Testament, the bit of the Bible written before Jesus, there were a specific group of people who were priests. But under this new covenant, this new arrangement of relating to God, all of us are priests. All of us are ministers. Called to minister not just um, in church on a Sunday, but to minister in our workplaces, to minister in our schools, in our hospitals, in our streets, in our gyms. Everywhere we go, we are representatives of God, called to bring his justice and mercy into every place that we're involved. And he says we're a holy nation, God's special possession. And that speaks of discipleship. It speaks that we are to be different to the world. And the more that we're Christians, the longer that we're followers of Jesus, we should become more like Jesus. And that's going to set us apart from the world. It's going to make us different what the Bible calls holy, set apart for God. Then it says that you may declare the praises of him, and that speaks of evangelism, that we are a people who declare God to the world around us. We speak what we know of Jesus and his salvation, of the difference that he's made in our lives and how others can come into a relationship with him. And then finally it finishes with his, you who were called out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that speaks of worship. Hey, we have this incredible God who has done an amazing thing for us through Jesus' death and resurrection. God has dealt with our past. Our past is forgiven. We don't need to be defined by the things that have happened to us up to this point. 
hey, our present has purpose, which we're looking at in this series. And our future is secure. Our future is a relationship with God, knowing him, being with him. And all of that has happened because of Jesus. And that it causes us to worship. So we're going to look at these five purposes at community, at ministry, at discipleship, at evangelism, at worship. And I think if you put those five together, you get a really rounded sense of what church is, what it's about, and why we all of us need to be part of church. So this week we're going to look at community. And we're going to center it around this word ecclesia. Ecclesia is the word which in our Bible gets translated church. So for instance, in Matthew 16, 18, one of the accounts of the life of Jesus, Matthew writes this, I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you that you are Peter. That's the same Peter that wrote this letter. You are Peter, Jesus says, and on this rock I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia. And we might think that ecclesia is a special word, is a specific Christian word, just as church is a Christian word in English. But ecclesia simply means an assembly or a group of people gather together. It's a gathering which could be informal or formal, orderly or disorderly, religious or secular. For instance, in Acts 19, which tells the story of the early church, we read of a riot which is caused by the preaching of a guy called Paul. And there in Acts 19, verse 32, we read that the assembly, the ecclesia, this is a, a pagan group um, who are up in arms, the assembly, the ecclesia, was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people didn't even know why they were there. And for this reason, when the Bible was first translated into English, that was done by a guy called William Tyndale in the 1520s, um, he had a question about how is he going to translate this word ecclesia. And he wanted to translate that word as congregation in his Bible. Now, at those, that time, congregation didn't have any special Christian connotation. It just meant a gathering of people. But in making that translation, he was violently opposed by the establishment, and particularly those close to Henry VIII. You remember Henry VIII and his six wives, um, who were actually defending the Catholic Church, and they wanted to emphasize the power structure of the church, that the church was an organization, that the church had people in charge. And this was particularly true of a guy called Sir Henry Moore. You'll come across him if you've read Hilary Mantel's books um, on Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell and all that crowd. And this is how Henry Moore described Tyndale. He described him as a hellhound in the kennel of the devil, discharging a filthy foam of blasphemies out of his brutish, beastly mouth. I imagine what Thomas More would have been like if he'd had Twitter. He would have been a danger to everyone. And More violently opposed Tyndale on a number of his translation choices. For instance, he wanted agape, which in our Bibles is translated as love, instead to be charity. He wanted metanoio, which in our Bibles is translated as repent, to be instead do penance. He wanted the idea that you could earn your salvation. And he wanted ecclesia translated as church, not congregation. Now then as now, church was a, a religious word which meant a, a number of things, um, including a building, a place where you worship. It meant the clergy, um, the monks or the priests who were working in the church. It meant denomination. It meant all sorts of things. But what it didn't mean is just people. And Tyndale was passionate about keeping this idea that church was people. And he stuck with congregation in his New Testament, which was first published in 1526, although that translation cost him his life. He was executed, he was martyred by strangulation and then burnt at the stake. And you see, can see a picture of that from Fox's Book of Martyrs, published in 1563. Sadly, although Tyndale translated Ecclesia as congregation, when the King James Bible was published in 1611, Ecclesia was translated as church, as it has now been ever since. And that, for me, was a huge shame. So now in our Bibles, I think when we hear the word church, we hear all sorts of things. I think we hear the word building. We talk about meeting you at the church, and we mean the building. We think about clergy. We talk about people going into the church and people becoming like full-time um, workers in church. We, we think of church as denominations, so we think of the church of... Um, 
the Catholic Church or the Church of England or the Methodist Church or the Pentecostal Church. But I think what we so often fail to hear when we hear the word church is people. And I want us to reclaim that sense that church is people. I want to challenge you whenever you use that word church or you, you hear others using that word church, you think, well, could I put people in place of that word? So, hey, it's probably all right to talk about going to church because we're going to gather as the people of God or, or coming together to be church. And I, I, we need to re recover that sense that church is people. Church is me and you coming together to worship God, to do stuff on God's behalf in our world. So what does it look like for us to be the people of God? Particularly as we emerge from our lockdown world back into an increasingly physical world. You see, as people, we've been separated as the people of God. We've been in our own homes, in our own spaces, and we might have been communicating over Zoom or WhatsApp or you know, keeping touch different ways, even going for walks, but we haven't had that sense of gathering together as God's people, either in small groups um, or on Sundays as we come together in larger gatherings. So what does that look like for us? Well, I want to take us to another section of Paul's letter, actually really near the end of his letter, where he says a little bit more about what does it look like to be the people of God. And we're going to learn four things here, um, which I think are key for us as we look to re-emerge physically as the people of God. Peter writes this, the end of all things is near. That phrase, the end of all things, doesn't mean that the, the very end when Jesus returns is close. What it actually means is that we're now living in the light of the resurrection of Jesus. We are the resurrection people. We're the people who know that Jesus was raised from the dead and that because of that, everything has changed. That now new birth, new life is possible, that our past has been dealt with that our present has purpose and our future is secure. We're people who now live with that knowledge. We're people who live in the, the good of that. So Paul says, Peter says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, because of that, be alert and sober of mind. Don't just race off being crazy and just like frittering your life away. Be alert and sober so that you may pray. That's the first thing we're going to look at, praying as the people of God. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. So we're going to look at loving one another deeply. Thirdly, he says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. We're going to think a little bit about what hospitality looks like. And then finally, he says, each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So, Let's just briefly look at those four. First of all, it says, pray. Peter says, pray for one another. Pray so that you may pray. And I, I think he's not predominantly thinking here about us praying around all the situations um, around the world and all the different things that are going on. I, I think he's thinking about us praying as community for one another. One of the things that I love in Paul's letters, um, one of the compatriots of Peter is that he writes in his letters, he often writes his prayers down. And his prayers are always for the people he's writing to. He, pr he prays that they might know God better. He prays that they might have a revelation of God's love for them. It pr he prays that they might encounter God and meet with him in, in so many different ways. And one of the things I've loved in lockdown is we've seen an increase in prayer. I just think of my own prayer life through this season. It's still been far from perfect. But I've been involved so much more in praying for others. I've been on Zoom calls for people in other nations, people like Sam and Hannah Fares Billam um, in Zambia and Andy and Mickey Partington in Bolivia. I've gathered with others on Zoom calls where we've prayed with them and for them. I'm on more WhatsApp groups than I can count, praying for different situations and different circumstances and getting weekly updates and monthly updates and, and praying into a whole load of situations. I know many of us have engaged in Lectio 365 in this season. We've been doing the prayer cast, our own prayer cast in this season. We've been joining in online church prayer meetings. Prayer has risen. And as we emerge back into a physical world, I want us to keep that 
sense of like praying for one another is a key thing for us to be about as the people of God. It's one of the distinctives of us that we're a people who pray for one another. When one of us is sick, we pray prayers of healing. When one of us is struggling to find a job, we pray for breakthrough. When one of us is sad, we pray for God to lift that person up. When somebody needs wisdom, we ask God for it. That we are a people of prayer for one another. And as we engage again physically, I would love that as we come together, one of the things that we do when we meet together is we pray for one another. Someone tells us of a need, someone tells us that they're not well, and we just go, hey, let me pray for that right now. So let's be a people who pray. Secondly, Peter says, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Let me remind you of this, church. We are all people, but we're all broken people. We're all flawed people. Sin has corrupted, sin has messed up every single one of us. And that means that when we come together, inevitably at times we sin against one another. We upset one another, we disappoint one another, we let down one another. And in one sense we've been a little bit isolated for that because we've been in different places, we haven't been mixing in the same way. And there will be some people who you haven't seen through lockdown who you think, oh my goodness, we weren't getting on too well prior to lockdown. And I think there's a danger in our culture now that that when relationships go south, when they go a bit sour, we just go, well, I'm not going to have anything to do with that person anymore. I'm just going to bail out. And people just don't bail out of relationships, they bail out of churches. I go, it's all got a bit hard, I got a bit hurt there, so I'm going to leave. I'm going to just go and either go to another church or even drop out of church completely and just do faith on my own. And Peter's encouraging us, no, go the other way. Part of us loving one another is for us to learn to forgive one another, to be able to overlook offences. Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And let's, as we begin to gather together physically, begin to forgive one another, begin to help one another, not afraid to point out things when things are wrong, but to do that in a heart and an attitude of love. That love would be the thing that characterizes our gathering together as the people of God, covering one another's sins. Thirdly, Peter writes, offer hospitality without grumbling. We're going to be connecting together physically. One of the wonderful things about being together physically is we eat meals together physically. I love that about our faith, that that eating meals, that that gathering together around tables is such a huge part of it. All the way through the Bible, people eating meals together. And I want to encourage us as we re-engage to be meeting again. Hey, on Sundays in small groups, but in other gatherings as well to invite people around for meals, to invite people out for a coffee, to go for a walk with people, to reconnect physically. And not just offering hospitality to our friends, the people we're close to, but people all across church. One of the things I've really noticed as I've been coming back to in-person events is how many new people there are. I was in Bracknell on Sunday and there were, there were people, a whole host of people who were there for the very first time gathering in church and joining our community. Those people so need to find hospitality, those who will reach out to them, who won't just chat to their friends and the people they know, but will reach out to those new folks or those struggling folks and invite them into their worlds and into their lives. I think the extent which we're going to flourish as a church is the extent which we can show hospitality to those outside of our immediate circles. As we gather again physically, why not on a Sunday have some extra food ready so that if you meet somebody new, you can invite them back to your home? Why not be thinking even in this season, hey, who could we invite round? Who have we met on a Zoom call but maybe have never met physically? Who have we seen but have have never connected with? Or maybe just know vaguely that we could invite into our homes and into our spaces. And don't moan about it. It's always a hard work element to inviting people physically. 
You know, there's washing up to be done afterwards. There's, you know, maybe it doesn't always go as well as we hoped. And, but Paul says, offer hospitality. Peter says, offer hospitality, but without grumbling. I don't moan about it. Don't like, you know, think you're a martyr. No, just, just do it because this is what we're called to do as the people of God. And then finally, Peter says, use your gifts. Each of you should use whatever gifts you've received to serve others. The word there for gifts is the Greek word charisma. It's the same word that Paul uses to talk about spiritual gifts when he talks about gifts of healing and prophecy and miracles. But here it, it means that, but it also means just the general gifts God has given us. Hey, maybe God's given you a gift of wisdom or a gift of administration or a gift of um, cooking or a gift of gardening or, you know, God gives all sorts of gifts to our communities. And part of us being the people of God is that we use our gifts to serve one another. And that's what we need to be doing as the people of God as we gather again. And I just want to highlight one particular area. Because one of the wonderful things about the people of God is that it's all ages. It's young and old. And it's the older folks among us coming together to equip and to bless the younger. And one area that we're really going to look to to re-resource as we come together is our, our youth work and our kids' work. We realise that you know, there'll be some folks who've served for years, who've decided this is the time for them to step down. There's people who've moved away. We're basically going to be re rebuilding those teams from scratch. And most of us in our community could host some youth or some kids, particularly on a Sunday as we gather. Many of you have got gifts. You could just be friendly or you could teach or you could administrate or you could get involved in some other way in our, in our children's work or our youth work. And as we come together as the people of God, I want to encourage everyone of us to be thinking, hey, could I engage in that? Could I be engaged in serving our young people, serving our children, serving our teenagers, maybe on a Sunday, maybe in a midweek capacity? And I would want to challenge a whole load of us to think about getting involved that way. But we might have other gifts to bring as well. I think as we're renovating the farm of a building, we're going to be having working parties where people can come and do their stuff, but we might have gifts to offer to individuals. Maybe you're good with money and you can sit down and help somebody else with their finances. Maybe you're good with, um, you know, gardening and you can help somebody map out their garden. I don't know what it is that you're good at, but use those gifts to the blessing of the family of God. Okay, so four things as the people of God. Four things that characterize. Let's pray for one another. Let's love each other deeply, forgiving one another. Let's offer hospitality without grumbling, inviting people into our homes and our spaces. And let's use our gifts, particularly around serving our young people and our children. Hey, we're now going to have a song of worship where we're going to again focus on our God. And when we've come back from that, I want to just lead you in a short response um, and just encourage you and suggest to you some just next steps that you might want to take along this journey. So, so let's worship our God now.